So what we saw was, you know, so what we saw was that that the underwriting models. Uh, so so what we saw was, you know, that the overall loss loss that the bank earns is comprised of two components. One is an expected loss. The other is an unexpected loss. Right? And in an expected loss plus an unexpected loss, right? Uh, so basically, the entire objective of risk management has been to monitor or manage these two broad losses. Now, the expected loss, as we said, arises from the portfolio behavior. So it's, it's, it's more or less an outcome of the portfolio losses. On the other hand, on the other hand, what we have is the unexpected losses. Now, the unexpected losses are uh, so. So these are kind of losses which which occur, you know, to which kind of occur uh, occur due to other factors, which is not necessarily related to lending, right? And as an example of an unexpected loss, we are trying to talk about. We we start talking about the global financial crisis. Now, quantitatively speaking, quantitatively speaking, we saw that the loss distribution that we that the bank has, right, is more or less it's a skewed distribution, right, and you have a certain tail value at the end. You have your mean value is slightly upward bias towards the unexpected losses because the unexpected losses are losses which have very low probability of occurrence. But their magnitude of occurrence is actually very high. On the other hand, what we have is uh, we have this unexpected loss, right? So, so the unexpected, so the expected loss is something like the average loss that a firm can, uh, that a bank can earn, right? And it is nothing but it's uh, as we call it uh, the average. So, so basically, it's an average loss, right? And we have seen how is it that the average can be computed. Now the unexpected loss, as we say, is a variation, which is a variance from the average loss. That is, it is a dispersion about the uh, uh, average loss or the expected loss. So whatever is not the expected loss is your unexpected loss, right? So over here, so over here, uh, what we get to do is, uh, yeah. So over here, what we get to do is, we get to, you know, kind of run. Uh, so basically, we, we get to see that, or uh, we need to explore that. Why is it that this unexpected loss becomes important? Because as we saw that, that the expected losses are covered with provisions, but you cannot cover everything with provisions because. The unexpected losses can be of such high magnitude that if you try to, co 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 I mean, cover them through your provisions, your pricing of the product would increase to such an extent that it would not be possible for you to sustain in business. Hence, the unexpected losses are covered to capital, right? The the two the differences is that you know provisions act as an expense, right? Whereas capital is a part of the balance sheet. Uh, it, it's a liability in the banks balance sheet right so so basically what you do is you raise capital right and through that capital what you do is you be your uh, so you keep that capital aside now the question that comes out is that why do i need to have that capital first of all the answer to that is to help you sail through difficult periods right and one such period that we talked about was the global financial crisis and there we saw that how is it that it uh, you know, how is it that this global financial crisis, how, what role did the banks play in generating that crisis, right? So how did that crisis generate? So it was generated not from the capital markets this time, but this was generated from the banking sectors this time, right? And what we tried understanding over here was that how does this entire equation work? And over there, we saw that, that, that because the banks were not adequately capitalized under pressure they had buckled down and they went for a, a simple crash right so this is where you know so this is where what we tried doing was uh, yeah so so this is where you know what we tried doing was we tried exp exploring the dynamics of 
uh, the unexpected losses on the week can impact the banks and why is it that the banks should maintain a sufficient amount of capital, right? So that's what we had uh, discussed till the last class. Now, in today's discussion, we would take it up right from there. Okay, uh, so Samit, uh, can you just go on mute, please? Because there's some kind of a background sound that is coming. So it would be great if you could be on mute. So you can unmute yourself and ask me your questions. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so now the question is that what is it that had made the global financial crisis so vicious? Right? Because we, we, we saw that, right? So that we said that, that there were firms, there were banks, or there were institutions who had invested in a lot of these assets and because they were they invested in a lot of these assets, from these assets the risks had, uh, you know, the risks had dispersed or the risk had, had come in from these assets. So the question that comes out to me is at this stage is that, so the question that comes out to me is that how is it that this had, or, or what could have been the possible impacts, right, if these banks had collapsed in the US. Now the question that comes out is that, 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 that if the banks had collapsed, if the bank, let's say, the government did not give any kind of uh, <coughs> bailout, right, and the banks had collapsed, what would have been the impact on the world and on the US? Now, one possible thing is that if the banks had collapsed, obviously US would have undergone a very bad phase. But how could that could it have impacted the world? Now let's take the example of a bank like let's say uh, Citibank, right? Let's say it's Citibank. Now let's say city is involved into subprime lending. Let's assume, right? Now, the city has its branches all across the world, right? They have their branches in India. They have their branches in, uh, obviously, US they have, they have it in the UK, they'll have it in the Middle East, they'll have it in the Middle East. Next, they'll have it, they, they, they have it all around, let's say they have it in Australia and so on, right? So a bank like this has multiple branches, let's say. And obviously, the headquarter is New York. The headquarter of this bank is NY. Now, if the city the city over here collapses now if city over here collapses So then what happens, right? So if things over here go undergo a downturn, then it obviously relates or you know links all these economies together. So all these economies on the other hand is related to city in New York. Right. So 
So now, when so if therefore if city actually collapses, what would happen? So city would undertake a cost-cutting venture, right? And therefore, a lot of people in these regions would also be impacted. And there will be huge layoffs happening all across. Right? So there would be huge layoffs which would happen all across. Now, now, now if that happens, all right, now if that is the case, then uh, what, what do we do or then how do we do it? So over here, the next thing that we want to do over here is the following. That when this, uh, you know, when this thing collapses, let's say, so a city uh, collapses and there is an increase in unemployment all across the globe, right? So, therefore, if city goes out of business, city has the capacity to drag an entire globe into recession or into a downturn by increasing the unemployment, right? And I had seen, you know, uh, that period of time, right, when Merrill Lynch had gone through those instabilities, I had seen people getting fired overnight in India. Right, and which was not really a very pleasant sight, and that's when you realize, you know, that how uh, interrelated are your economies, and one change, one shock over there, can send the tremors right up to, uh, right across the globe, and the entire globe can enter into a recession. So, so obviously, right, it is very important that city maintains that capital, right, which would help it sail through the different challenges when the global financial crisis, uh, you know, when there is a downturn which comes in. And that's why there are two things which need to be done. The first thing is we need to test whether city is adequately capitalized. is adequately capitalized. Right? City adequately capitalized or not and the second thing that you need to do over here is you need to ensure that that city has an adequate capital not only it has an adequate capital but it has a capital such that it can sail through without collapsing it can sail through different kinds of stress periods right so that's where the requirement for stress testing actually comes in now there are multiple uh, what should i say so there are multiple areas you know where uh, stress stress uh, like so the so, so there are multiple regions right like uh, the european banks have this own stress testing framework uh, the middle east uh, banks have their own stress testing frameworks us have their own stress testing framework but the most comprehensive stress testing framework is perhaps divided by designed by the US guys, right? And you know, so these guys have developed the or these guys they have this framework, the CJCR C car framework, which distinctly lays down the guidelines for stress testing. And they stress test the capital across these scenarios. One is baseline. Then it's adverse scenario. And then it's severely adverse. Scenario. Severely adverse. 
civil. So these are the three things, right? And the entire idea behind the stress testing regulations are, and the stress testing regulations, you know, they came in after the 2008 crisis, and it and it was started from 2010 onwards. So with 2010, we got the first stress testing regulation that US uh, had right out that US brought up, which was a part of the Dodd Frank Act of stress testing. <coughs> the Dodd Frank Act came out uh, as a as a rule, as a set of guidelines to, you know, uh, to analyze the different risks which are there in the U.S. Uh, that are present in the management system after the crash, and how is it that they could be mitigated? What should be the best practices going around, right? And from there, what we got to see is that this Dodd Frank Act stress testing bust. Right. So dot frank access testing uh, would actually, you know, kind of help you get things done over here, right? So this is where uh, this thing works up, right? So so that was the first stress testing and which came in and after that, it was followed by the CCAR. So I don't remember the exact dates of CCAR happening, right? Or uh, the CCAR being introduced, but yes, CCAR was uh, after the dot frank act. Right. So I think it was 2011, 2012, something like that. Uh, right. So, so that's how you know the the stress testing regulations came into play. Whereas this adequate capitalization, or when we talk about adequate capitalization and all, so Basel had always been there. So Basel was there since the 1980s. But the so the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the BCBS, was there. But it was just that uh, Basel did not, you know, kind of, uh, so, the, so the importance there of Basel, it was not very strictly imposed on the banks, right? So it was there, banks knew that this was the capital adequacies that they need to maintain and so on, but because they were imposed. It was only after this crisis had happened and the globe had undergone a downturn, it had hit a terrific recession, that... Basel had uh, come in, right? So this is something that we have uh, seen, right? So from this perspective, the next thing that that we will do is we want to understand that uh, how is it that this uh, thing should so so basically you know so from our understanding so from, from our point we need to understand that how does how uh, how would a gcp operate how does a basel uh, have its or you know how does a basel uh, help the bank assess its guidelines right and what is a ccar and deba so what are the basic frameworks involved with these different regulations. Right? Now, obviously, yes, uh, from the US point of view, the other set of regulations that we have is the provisioning regulations, which previously was the AL uh, launch of a loans and losses, where, uh, you know, you had maintained or uh, you had regulations like the financial accounting standards, five financial standards, 114, and and a whole lot of other regulations, which is now come, which is now been more or less replaced by, or in the the process of being substituted by the CCL, the CCL framework, right? So, so there are these lot of these different regulations which are there in the U.S. Uh, geographies. Uh, I mean, all the world is now the entire banking system all across the globe is regulated, but you know, the one related with. The U.S. economies have gained too much of a limelight, right? So this is something that we need to kind of understand. So this is something that we need to kind of assess. 
So, okay, so before I move on, any questions up to this point? This was pretty uh, introductory in nature, but still, in, in case you have any questions. No, Tanmay, nothing for now. Perfect. Perfect. So the first question that comes out over here is, the first point that we start our discussion with today would be Basel. Now Basel is huge, right? So there are many papers, there are many uh, topics, there are, there are lo uh, a hell lot of different things in Basel, right? Now, it's, uh, now if I start talking about, if we start going into the very nitty gritties of Basel every time we, we talk about credit twist, uh, <clears throat> I believe this module should be, uh, you know, put at a decade timeline. Right, so we'll not be doing that. So we'll just be looking into the overall framework of Basel first, and from there, we'll try exploring, uh, you know, the the, the different uh, models uh, which are there. We we'll just talk about why PDLCD, EAD, what are these models, and what are they about, right? And uh, what ultimately is the objective? So basically, uh, Okay, so when we when we say Basel, right? So uh, something comes to our mind, right? It it means that okay, this is a set of regulations. But actually, Basel is not a regulation, right? So we have actually created a shortcut of this original name of the regulations. So the original regulation is, I mean, the regulations actually are issued by some a body called the B I S, which is the bank of international settlements. Bank of International Settlements. Now this Bank of International Settlement is now the Bank of International Settlement is a bank you know which is uh, what should I say so the Bank of International Settlement is a bank, uh, which is, or, or it's a body, you know, which, issue, which issue the standards for for capital adequacy that banks must maintain that they you know, so, so it's a regulatory body. And this Bank of International Settlement is based out of Switzerland at a place called Basel. So Basel is actually a place and it's not a set of regulations. And the, the, the entire regulatory framework, right, is actually known as the BCBS, which is the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, right? So that's the committee within BIS which issues these accords, right? So the, the, the accords are, so Basel is the place, right, and the accords are issued by the BC yes right so this is issued by the BCBS that is the Basel Committee of Banking Supervision right so once this is done right so once this part is done the next thing that we'll talk about over here is the following that what are these accords for what do these accords talk about? 
they talk about capital adequacy. Capital adequacy. And what this says that, you know, so what they say is that, that when, uh, so what should be the optimal amount of capital that needs to be kept back? So ideally what they say is that it must be 8% of the RWA. Right? So 8% of the risk weighted assets should be kept as the now the question that comes out over here, and this is the most important concept that Basel has, that is the risk-weighted assets, right? Or as we call it, the RWA. RWA, right? Now, what is this RWA and why why risk weighted? So let's say you know banks often have two types of items on their on their books. One is an on balance sheet item. One is an on balance sheet item right and the second type of thing that you have is an off balance sheet item The second that we have is called the off balance sheet item. Is the off balance sheet item. One is an on balance sheet item, and the second is an off balance sheet item. Now, the question is that, that what is this on balance sheet and off balance sheet item? Now, you know, on balance sheet items are items which can be easily seen, right? But off balance sheet items are items, you know, which cannot be seen or which are not, which are not there on the balance sheet of the bank, right? And hence, you cannot account for the risks of those assets. But actually, those assets are risky assets. Let's take a very simple example. So, uh, all of you have credit cards, right? Okay, uh, so basically in credit cards, what happens is you have a limit of your limit attached to your, um, to your card, right? To your card product. Now, let's say your limit is... is one lakh right so limit is one lakh 
Now, when your limit is 1 lakh, it is, it, it is not always necessary that you will be using that entire 1 lakh, right? So, what might happen is that the balance that you have on your card So the balance that you have on uh, on your card, or that is the amount that you have used, is forty thousand. So the on balance sheet item, or the on balance sheet amount that you have used the card for, is forty thousand. So that's an on balance sheet item, or that's an on balance sheet amount. But the remaining sixty thousand is something which you cannot see on the balance sheet. Right, you cannot see the remaining sixty thousand on the balance sheet, but that amount is equally risky as well. So that's an off balance sheet item, right? So the risk, so there is a risk associated with the balance which is on the balance sheet, as well as there is a risk associated with the balance which is off the balance sheet, because the remaining headroom that you have for this credit card, which is your limit minus balance, right? So that is something that you can just run down before you just go into default. So that's risky as well. So if I'm keeping aside capital for 40,000, I also need to keep aside capital for the remaining 60,000 as well. And that is where, you know, the concept of this, uh, what should I say? So the concept of this balance sheet actually comes into play. I mean, the off balance sheet, actually, off balance sheet items come into play, and that's why you know your assets has to be risk weighted for all on balance sheet items and for all off balance sheet items. You need to adequately weigh the risk, and then you need to go about that. Right? Is this part clear? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. So Seva has a question over here. Uh, so he asks that any example of uh, of balance sheet from organization point of view. So Seva, can you just clarify this concept of an organization point of view? Like, <laughs> hello, Tamil. Yeah. yeah. Like, the, like the example which you have given is for the like the customer point of view. Like, if we have a credit card and we can. Like we can see, like which is which one is a like on balance sheet or off balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Like from the company point of view, like how we can identify which one is off balance sheet. Like on balance sheet, we can see the assets and liability from the balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. We can easily we can see each and everything from the off balance sheet. How no, we no, can this off balance sheet item? No, no, no. See, so so this is also from the company's point of view because whenever the bank is working for me, the balance is not a risk. As a customer, oh, okay. so the risk okay, okay. is with, with the bank, mm -hmm. right? Now, the one that you are saying is, let's say, also a company has invested in a derivative, right? Or so there is a yes, so they have invested in a derivative. Now, when this derivative is issued, right? So that is, or uh, and let's say that's an unsettled derivative, right? So then that is an off balance sheet item, but that derivative is equally risky right so because it is equally risky the capital needs to be set aside for that as well so for any kind of off balance on balance sheet or off balance sheet item they must be weighted by their respective risks yeah for the other example we can say that like if the company is going to be issue an ipo and sometimes company not call for all the capital from the shareholders. The remaining capital which is still left from the shareholder, uh, that we can say that off balance sheet. No, see, generally when I talk about, see, basically when we talk about risk weights, right, we need to first of all identify that risk weights is something related to the assets of the bank, right? So, Whenever a bank is giving out a loan or the bank is making an investment from which it expects to earn a return, but it involves a risk with, with it, that is where the risk weighted assets come into play. 
Now, talking about capital, the bank is trying to raise a capital, right? And if they do not raise an entire amount of capital from the market, right, to an IPO, right, and they fund that the remaining endogenously, I'm not sure whether that is going to be an asset or not because capital typically is treated on the liability side of a balance sheet, right? So whenever we are talking about risk-weighted assets, because see, the capital that the bank has with it is not off balance sheet because the remaining, they, so let's say the bank requires a capital of $1 million or 100 million. Out of the 100 million, what they are doing is they are funding, they are, they are raising an IPO for 90 million. The 10 million, they are providing it from their end to retained earnings or something like that. So, the, so, so there is no risk associated with that capital, right? So that's there to provide a buffer. And it's, it is providing the buffer against the risk. So where is the risk involved in the story? The risk is involved in the story where you are lending out the money. When the money is going out from the bank to an outside party, right? And you are giving the money to him and you need to ensure that there is as much a probability of him paying it back. Because if it's cash, you know, if it's cash with the cash as an asset with the bank, that is 0% RWA, right? So, so obviously, every bank needs to win in a risk-weighted asset. And 8% of the risk-weighted assets is your uh, capital and it's multiple by 12.5 as a multiple. And then you get that uh, the, the actual capital that is there, right? So, so, so the basic objective of our, you know, of the bank, or the, I mean, so the basic objective of these uh, of the Basel framework is to address this RWA. So ultimately, the output or, or the calculation ultimately that we could do is to reach to that RWA. So all these PD, LGD, EAD, everything is defined just to reach to that risk weighted assets.